without any further delays, let's get started. So, here's my personal timer. On you go. All right. So, we have like 45 minutes to go. So, my name is Antti Pajunen. Um, don't even try to pronounce that name if you're not Finnish. Uh, that, that burden is solely on me. I am a... This is what, what, what do I do for a living? So I'm a power platform consultant, a CRM consultant, Microsoft project management, and you know, blah, blah, blah. I work on power platform. So, so that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, Biz apps MVP for the past one and a half years or so, uh, married to two, two kids. I'm a, and my beautiful wife and, uh, a, a, you know, huge whiskey aficionado. So enough about me. I am doing some demo flows. Like I said, I am a whiskey aficionado. Uh, I have sacrificed to the demo god yesterday, which might, which you might hear from my uh, voice and my look, perhaps. Uh, so the demos that I'm doing, you know, demo god has gotten its sacrifice, so it all should go well. Uh, demo god's not failed me before. So what is this session about then? Uh, the agenda is something as follows. I'm going to describe really briefly what Power Platform is from my point of view, you know, how I see Power Platform. And then again, you know, I, I, this is a selfish session, by the way. So, so then I'm going to give you some tips and tricks about Power Automate uh, and, and some different flows, again, really based on my experience. And the the reason that I, that I've chosen this angle is is because a lot of the things that I do in flows are actually repeats. Uh, I've been doing flow for about two two or two and a half years, and a lot of the things that I do are you know pretty much the same actually. And what I am going to describe to you is is really from a CDS point of view, from from sort of like a CRM consultant point of view. So so if there is some uh, SharePoint fans here. I'm sorry, you might be disappointed. I'm not gonna really touch SharePoint. I'm not gonna really touch the, the office world. It, it is primarily from a CDS uh, point of view. And then as time permits, I do have a couple of demos. Uh, let's see how much time time we have. I have a pretty robust slide deck ahead. And, and, and really before I jump into the three clouds, I wanna give a huge you know, I want to give huge kudos to some people in the community, Daniel Askovitz, uh, Ryan McLean, Sarah, uh, Sarah Lagerquist, uh, definitely David, uh, David Yak from the U.S., uh, geez, John Liu for sure, Eliza Benitez, Matt Collins-Jones, and I have probably forgotten uh, tons of other people, John, John Vilek and so on. Really what I'm covering here is based on what I've learned from those people. So, so I'm actually, the presentation is pretty much stealing from others to be very, to the, to be very blunt. Uh, but, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Other people have solved these problems before and I'm sort of like pulling these together and, you know, delivering these to you as I see these, like I said, I see these things as something that really repeats when I work on CDS. So how do I see the power, pla the, the power platform? Microsoft has three clouds, right? It has Office, it has Dynamics, and it has Azure. And what Power Platform is to me is really a convergence of all these, all those, all these three clouds. So Power Platform makes those three different clouds, individual clouds, and I don't almost say silo clouds, a homogenous whole. And we have these apps on or, or services on Power Platform, which are Power Apps for acting on data, uh, Power BI for analyzing that data, Power Automate for automating, and Power Virtual Agents for well, acting, automating, self-service bots. I guess you know you could call it something else as well. Uh, so it really pulls these three different clouds together. And to me, Flow is really at the center of everything. So that is really that glue that glues all these three different clouds together and allows us to automate and integrate those those clouds into a single whole. From a from a professional point of view, flow has really transitioned the way I I'm able to deliver value to my customers immensely. It is by far and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, I think it's the most important part on the whole platform, at least to me it is, because it has really transitioned what I can do as a functional consultant 
to a completely other level. So, so more of that stuff where I needed a developer before, I can now do that on my own. Now with power comes responsibility. So keeping that in mind, you do also need to learn some best practices around building flows uh, so that your flows are, are efficient and they don't fail and they can scale. So when, when a customer's business scales, you need to make sure that your flow scales with your customer's business and can really handle all, you know, all, all the, all, all the skin scenarios that you're thinking that it will when you're, when you're, you know, building it for small scale at first. So let's jump into some flow tips and tricks. I'm going to start off with connectors. And this is really like a, a mixture of, I guess, like level 100, 200, 300, and full 400 stuff. So it's kind of all over. Um, for some of you, it might be very basic. For some of you, it might be like, oh, wow, I didn't really think of that before. So I'm hoping you're going to get some gotchas out of this session. Uh, connectors. We got three connectors, Dynamics 365. Forget about it. Forget about the Dynamics 365 connector. It has been deprecated. If you have flows that use this connector, start refactoring those flows. You know, you're not in a rush just yet, but you will be at some point in time. So if you have D365 connector uh, based flows, refactor them. Then we also have a CDS connector, which is sort of like the older connector. Now it can do some cool things that the new one can't. So the old connector is primarily used when you're uh, when you're inside your tenant, when you're integrating your th different environments, or you're putting pulling data from, let's say, you're pulling data from your environment one, production environment one, to your production environment two. That's when you're going to use the older CDS connector because the new one, the current environment connector, that really that that only works inside the environment where you are building it to. All right, and it, worth you know worth mentioning and realizing the CDS CE connector that is the one where Microsoft is putting all its effort to. So if you can use that connector, you should use that connector. It's also the the one that's that's also solution aware. Uh, as you probably know, solutions are, you know, those containers that you really should use when you're building, uh, building your flows. So it is solution aware, and when you're transporting your solutions from one environment to another, you don't have to reauthenticate your connections when you're using the CDSC connector. Uh, there's probably some other gotchas that I was going to say about the connectors, which I'm conveniently forgetting. But anyways, let's move on because we have a lot of stuff here. Uh, all right, so how do you choose the connector? So this is like, uh, th this is a trick every time I hit flow and my, Microsoft has made this a, uh, a, a super single, uh, simple feat for us. So how do you know if you're choosing the, the old CDS connector or the new uh, CDS current environment connector? It's based on these three and let's see if I can make my mouse show on the, uh, on the recording. It's these three dots, these three ellipses right here. That is the, that is the current environment connector. So the one further to the right when you're choosing a, a trigger is the one, and the further to the right when you're choosing an action is the current environment connector. Uh, we've been asking uh, Microsoft and, and, and Steven Siciliano's team for about one and a half years to do some tweaks to the icons. Uh, we've not seen that yet, but they have said that you know something along the lines of the, of, of the simpler solution should be coming at some point for, for us to be able to more easily choose the connectors that we want to do. So the biggest thing, uh, one of the biggest things to me with the, with the CE connector is, uh, and not customer engagement, current environment CE connector, is that, that I can fire off flows when I create them, when I update them, or when I delete them. Well, delete is something I really haven't used more than maybe once or twice, but it's nice to be able to fire off a flow when a record is either created or updated with this with the older uh, uh, CDS connector, you need to have two flows. You need to have a flow that that fires off on create and a flow that fires off on update. With the CE one, all you need is a single connector to do uh, both kinds of operations. And also, you know, from from a administrative administrative point of view, 
you can use service principles with uh, a CE connector. Um, I'm not actually sure if you can use it with the, the, the older C, uh, CDS connector or not, but at least with the CE connector, you can use service principles so you don't have to build your flows and then fire off your flow actions based on a named user. All right, so one of the biggest gotchas and takeaways to me from this presentation is, is you know, and if, if there's nothing else that you take away from this, take this. Uh, always filter your, try, try to filter your triggers and, and filter your, like you filter your list actions, filter your triggers because you can really, you know, you can really uh, granularly, define, granularly define when your flow is going to fire off and you, you're going to save a ton of API calls if you filter your triggers so that they really only fire fire when 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 a certain action is happening in CDS. So for this example, I'm filtering this trigger based on first name and and last name. It it, it is an O data style filter expression. So when first name is Mike and and last name is Ipsum, that trigger trigger fires off. And you really have two two ways of of doing that those filters. You can either punch in the filter expression on your trigger right here, or you can go to these three ellipses and choose settings, and then try uh, type in an expression uh, st style trigger condition. Now, some people have said that that this doesn't always work these days. I've been able to make it work just fine. Um, oh, I'm wondering myself when this goes away because the old data style filter expression is a heck of a lot simpler than punching in and, and sort of like an expression t uh, style trigger condition. So this is the one on the left is what I would uh, really suggest you use. Oh, someone's at the door. So with list records actions, and there, there, here's some gotchas as, as, as well. Like I said, filter your triggers and definitely always filter your list records actions. Learn OData syntax. It, it really is worth it. And with learn it, I mean learn the basics. You know, write down some of those most frequently used uh, syntaxes in your OneNote or, or in your One uh, Notepad or, or whatever, so that you can reuse those easily. But it's really, it's really worth learning the very basics of of of, of, of OData syntax. And always, always filter those results in your list records actions. Uh, something that has recently or recently some months ago changed with that is that uh, pagination. This is so hard. Where does the pagination pagination? Anyways, you get the point uh, that has changed so that a uh, single retrieved page with the seek with a new current environment connector is 5000 records. So it used to be 512 and then I think it was kicked up to a thousand or fifteen hundred or something, it is now five thousand. So what that pagination really means is, is if you have uh, five thousand and one records in your CRM or your CDS database, you're going to get the first five thousand. So fire, kick off that page, pagination, turn it on and increase the threshold. The maximum is a hundred thousand and you're going to be able to fetch a lot more records at once. If you need to go through uh, more than 100,000 records, then you're probably talking about you know a, a bigger enterprise grade system, and you need to do some additional tricks uh, for that. But you know, kick it up, set set the threshold. If you use filters, it doesn't really matter what your threshold is, even if you, you know put it up to 100,000, as long as you learn and remember to filter those results. So, how do you how do we do those filters then? How do we do those filters? So if we're, filter, uh, if we're filtering strings in our filter query, what we're going to do is we're going to put those inside single quotes. So first name equals, and then the word Mike inside single quote quotes fetches all the records with first, first name equaling, equaling Mike. Now, if we're referencing or filtering an option set, we're not going to use single quotes. We're just going to punch in a number. So preferred contact method equals one without single quotes. Now, if we're filtering based on lookups, what we're going to do is we're going to put an underscore, then the logical name underscore value equals 
the the uh, the GUID that we're looking for. So here on the left, what we're doing is we're listing contact records, and we're 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 filtering those contact records. Uh, we're filtering contact records based on on a uh, uh, on a, on an account. So underscore uh, logical name underscore value equals and then the GUID. Now, if we're filtering based on a records GUID here on the which you can see here on the right, what you're going to do is you're going to put in the entity primary key and then equals and a GUID. So you know there there's some gotchas and ticks and tips and and things to remember on these filters. Uh, the good thing is I'm going to publish this presentation. So you can you know copy paste these to your own notebook or use this as a reference later on. And I also have a, a pretty nice demo flow that has all these inside that flow. So you can get that flow for yourself and, and use that to go through these on your own time. Now, another thing for filtering is fetch XML. And, and this is super handy when you got to do like, you know, you got to do link entities and whatnot. Fetch XML can be a lifesaver in, in, in some situations. You don't really have to learn how to write fetch XML. I don't, but what I do, uh, what I have learned is, is I've learned to use uh, MVP Jonas Rapp's Fetch XML Builder. So don't work too hard. Use Fetch XML Builder to write your Fetch XML. It's fairly straightforward. You're gonna give yourself like 30 minutes to learn the builder, and then you're you know proficient with it and build your Fetch XML queries using that. Or you can use Advanced Find, like I think Eliza demoed Advanced Find in uh, in Dynamics. You can use that as well. Uh, I usually use uh, Jonas Raps Fetch XML Builder if I have more complicated queries. Uh, you know, jumping on to the world of the amazing Microsoft Graph, and wow, for for like a, for a CRM person, for a Dynamics person, Microsoft Graph is just you know, it's, it, it's different. It's just amazingly different. That world is. I always said that I think that world is so much more complicated than than CDS and Dynamics, but with Microsoft Graph you can really do cool things and and using the the Azure uh, HTTP with Azure AD connector you can get delete patch post or put against Microsoft Graph to really unlock the world of Office. You know interact with your or your uh, colleague's calendar. You know, if you want to be nasty, you can create some exchange events in your colleague's calendar and they're like, hey, what's, you know, I should be on the other side of the country to tomorrow in a customer meeting. What's up with that? Um, so use um, use the invoke with uh, HTTP with Azure AD to interact with Graph. I would use that instead of instead of the other premium HTTP connector because with this one, you don't have to put in any client secrets in your flow. So your flow is going to be more secure uh, for outside people. If someone, you know, someone else is, is dissecting your flow, they're going to get hold of your secret and all that stuff. Bad. That's bad. So I would use this one. All right. So then some uh, tips and tricks. So concurrency control on trigger. This is another thing that if you you know take something away from this presentation, and in, in addition to OData filter queries, take this. If you use concurrency control on your trigger, that means that that trigger will really be locked to concurrency control. And it does say that it cannot be undone once enabled. I didn't believe it, so I had to you know naturally try it, and. You know, even if you delete your trigger and add it back in, it's it's still on. It doesn't go anywhere. So essentially what you have to do is rebuild your own flow, or at least, you know, that was that's how I found it to be. So if you have a long flow and you go and turn this off, you're, you're out of luck. You got to rebuild your flow. So really consider the use cases for this one. And if we have time, I do have a demo for this where you can kind of think if using this would be more feasible than than the, the solution that I have implemented. Uh, let's hope that we have time to, to kind of cover that. Secure input and output is fairly new. It hasn't been in that long. So under an actions settings, so you go to those three ellipses and then you go to settings, you can turn on securing input and output. Uh, so, you know, fairly straightforward. It, sound, it, it is what, as it sounds like. Uh, when you look at the output of your 
actions, you're, you're not going to see anything there because the output has been secured. Concurrency control. If your flows are running slow, if you have an apply to each loop, consider using degree, consider using concurrency uh, control and setting a degree of parallelism. Wow, that's a hard word, parallelism. Uh, uh, you know, a word of caution though, it can cause your flows to fail in some cases. So this is really, this is trial and error, especially if you're uh, playing with variables like setting variables and whatnot, then you should be kind of careful when you use this because this actually means that these loops will run in parallel. It's really great for something like I have here on the left, like get records or, or list uh, records or something like that. You can just crank it up all the way to 50 and speed up your flows. But if you're playing with variables, or if you have nested apply to each loops, then you know be wary, trial and error, try how it works. For this one, for actions, you can turn it off after you have turned it on. So, so it's only for triggers. When you do that for triggers, you're you know out of luck after you turn it on. But for actions, you, you always have an option of revert, kind of uh, go back and revert. Error handling in your flows, super important. Always consider worst cases. Always consider scenarios that your flows might fail. And trust me, your flows will fail. So when you're building your logic, use configure run after and, and use that to build error handling into your flows. And as we go to a to the demo portion, I do have example some examples of this. Change sets are kind of cool, uh, fairly new as well in the CDS CE connector. So change a, a change set is really a single API call. Yes, a single API call. And inside a change set, you can use, uh, they are create, update, or delete actions. And the nice thing about it is, is if an action in that change set fails, all the previous operations are rolled back. So that's that's really that can be really handy. Now there are some limitations to referencing records. Um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking, was it so that that you can't reference? Uh, it, I can't reference the create a new account record. I can't re reference uh, this action with dynamic content when I'm playing with the update a contract record. I think that was the case. Um, if it wasn't someone, you know, shout out or post in chat that I'm wrong. Um, so chain sets, you know, rolling back changes if, if an action fails really handy. Then again, remember to use error handling if an action fails. So as you can see that update a contract record that has failed, if I wouldn't have this error handling step here, which, was, which essentially says that run this scope a dash string if this previous scope change set has uh, succeeded or failed. If I wouldn't have the, the run after configured for failed, then my flow would essentially fail. So a bit of trial and error again with chain sets, but they can really save you some time. They can save you some API calls as well. Child flows. Um, before this uh, presentation, I really had to familiarize, familiarize myself with child flows again. Uh, Daniel Laskovich, Laskovich has a good video on, on these, how to use them. So I suggest you check out his video. You can find it on, uh, on, on YouTube. Child flows are extremely great for more complex flows. So if you have, instead of building a huge flow, and putting all your logic into a gigantic flow, consider building your flow into smaller pieces. It really helps with error handling, and and well, not error handling, but diagnosing your your errors, which your flow will eventually run into. So for complex and long flows, you know, put it into smaller chunks. Use child flows. It's going to be a lot easier for another person coming in later after you to understand what's going on and to diagnose possible errors. There is, uh, these I wrote, there's something about a, 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 a link to Peter's blog. I wonder what I was thinking about there. Uh, 
maybe it's maybe I'll cover it on the demo part. So clearing lookup fields. This is this this is this can be tricky. So when you have a record and you want to clear a lookup field, you would I guess you'd automatically think that what you're going to do is you're just going to punch in null, right? You're just going to punch in null, and boom, that lookup field will clear. Well, wrong. That's not the case. You need to unrelate records to clear a lookup field. So the unrelate records action, if you've been wondering what the heck is that for, that is is exactly used for or can be used for relating records, but also unrelating records. So clearing lookup fields. It's a bit more work. I know, you know, it's it would be a lot simpler if we could just use punch in null and then we'd get, you know, those those uh, lookup fields cleared. So how about setting those lookup fields? Another gotcha. This is probably one of the, I could probably argue one of the most asked questions in the community, or I would think one of the most asked questions in the community around setting lookup fields using the current environment connector. So, so pay attention. This relates to using the CDS CE connector, not the the older one. So when you when you are uh, setting lookup fields, O data syntax is used. So the way to do that is, is you're going to punch in the name of the entity in plural and then put in a good inside parentheses. Now, the gotchas here are that that not all entity schema names slash logical names are really what you think they are. So for example, cases incident activity is activity pointer invoice line is invoice line uh, is invoice detail so it's i would have a a bookmark to the cds entity reference available where i could check what the name of the entity actually is before i'm setting the, the lookup fields because this is again it's, it's a lot of trial and error i spent countless of probably hours in total wondering why the heck my flow doesn't work simply because i've had the ent entity name incorrectly so frequent expressions, you're going to see this on the demo that I'm going to run. I seems I still have 20 minutes to go. Uh, so the frequent expressions will, you know, you'll see these and in, in, in those demos. So I'm just going to run these really, really quickly. These are some of the most used expressions that that I use in flows. It, these just kind of keep coming back. And again, you know, you can use this presentation to copy paste these expressions to your own notebook or where, wherever you want to store them for you to be able to reference them later when you're building your own flows. So if you're checking a, a list, if a list records action returns any act, uh, any records and you have a condition there, this is what you would punch in. So empty outputs, your the name of your list records and question mark body slash value. Compose first returned record from a list record a records action. This is something that I use fairly often. So I only want the first returned record from the list records action. This is how uh, you would type it. Now, if I only want a, a specific value of a specific field from the first returned record, then this would be the expression. Now there's kind of two different ways of, of punching this in. If you don't use this question mark right here, it means that, and it, so, so, so the first example, we just have a dot and then the, the field name here. If you use this and there is no uh, value in that field, boom, your, your flow will, that, that action will fail. Versus if you punch in your expression like this, you have that question mark here and your field is empty, no worries, you know, your at flow will continue, your action will succeed. So it'll check, you know, it, in, in this case, it doesn't matter if, you're, um, if your field is empty or not. Consider which logic you want to take based on some following, uh, following steps. So this really is around, again, a question around error handling. Should your flow fail if a field is empty or should it continue in another, in, in another path perhaps? Uh, compose actions, this is, I think this is a monster. This is a monster expression. First split, last split. I mean, it, 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 even, it even sounds ridiculous, right? First split, last split. Uh, but oh boy, I've used this so many times. So compose a string from a, a, uh, a, a value. So theoretically, if you don't know, 
you know, we, we talked about setting those lookup fields. If you don't know the entity name, you could, with the first split, last split, you could, you know, pull the value that, that we had after O data link in a get records action, and then just, you know, automatically populate that lookup field with this expression. A cool thing for this is if you want to pull out a word, extract a word from a single sentence, you could also do a first split, last split, and then, you know, pull, pull out a specific uh, 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 word from this. I think this extracts, I think this was, extracts cool, I believe. Uh, some other expressions, if you want to choose a certain value from an HTTP request instead of using parse JSON, you know, body, then the name of the, the action, and then question mark, and then just the, 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 the name of, of what you're looking for. So, so in this example, mail, it will be getting the, uh, the mail address of, of myself. So this is a this is a get my profile against Microsoft Graph, and it will fetch to this compose. It'll fetch my email address. It's kind of funny because you have this as a UPN here, and it's fetching the same thing. All right, so it's it's really demo time right now. We have 15 minutes to go. Uh, I'm not going to come back to this PowerPoint uh, PowerPoint anymore. So session recordings are available if someone's wondering. They are at this URL. And still have 50 minutes to go, but Thomas is up next with some adapt awesomeness around adaptive cards. With that said, let's jump into not my Twitter, but my Edge prep browser. All right. So the things that, that we just covered, here's a flow that really contains all of that good, good stuff. And and I'm going to make this uh, available to you all in uh, in an unmanaged solution later on, so you can dissect this and you know see how this works. But basically, this flow is fired off when a mobile phone field on a contact, which is Mike Gibson, is changed. And for the sake of brevity, because it takes a few seconds for this flow to run, I'm just going to start dissecting it, dissecting it with you guys. So the flow fires off. Here you can see that filter expression. So if we're talking about Mike Ipsum and his email address equals Mike Ipsum at Lauren Ipsum Corporation, then this trigger fires off. Now we're going to do a get records action, simply basic stuff here. Uh, we're going to do an account, get account record after this, fairly basic stuff here. Scopes, this is where we hit scopes. So scopes are really a good way to, to make your flows look cleaner. So as you can see, I got quite a few scopes here. If I wouldn't use these scopes, you could imagine how, you know, how cluttered this flow would really look. So with scopes, you can arrange your flows into smaller, you know, more digit, uh, digestible chunks. All right, so here's an example of that update contact record. So I'm trying to clear my uh, company name here with a null value and jumping over to another instance of the same flow, you can see that trying to clear that with a null, it just fails, right? So what we have to do is we have to do an unrelate records to clear that uh, to clear that lookup field. And what we're doing here is we're setting that uh, lookup field then again, and then we're using unrelate records to really rinse, rinse and repeat, so to say. All right, so this is, this is again for composing those uh, string values uh, by using that first split, last split. So this is a random string that we have here. And using that first split, last split action uh, expression, we can compose a certain word from within that string. So looking at the results from a from our flow, we can see that we have in our output we have cool. So first split, first split, last split is we can get some uh, certain certain strings out of a uh, um, out of a string value. Surprisingly, I'm using that surprisingly quite a few times. Execute a change set request. So here's that change set request. So create a new account, update a contact. We have that important error handling step here. So if this fails, which is which I believe it has failed, 
if I wouldn't have that air handling step, this is where my flow would sort of break. So the you know the butt would stop here. So have that air handling step when an, an action has failed, or actually when this scope has failed, continue on with the flow. All right, so then we're talking about, uh, next we're talking about strings. I still have a few minutes to go. Let's try if I can uh, actually have time to show the cooler demo. So uh, here is a list record or a, a compose action based on this list record. So I'm listing contacts and then I am composing the first returned value. And then in this action, in this compose, I'm composing the first name field from that list records action. So why am I doing this? If I wouldn't use this expression, then I would have an apply to each loop and I would just, you know, get loops and loops and loops and loops. So this is a way to really, you know, avoid that apply to each by punching in a, a first. So if we look at the actions right here on the left, we have that list records action. We can see that the output is, uh, Oh, geez, that's not the right one. Here we go. We can see that this one returns that whole, you know, the the whole what do you call it, the value or the body or whatever of, of the first routine uh, of the first list list, and this is where we have that first name record Mike returned. And if I wouldn't use this again, I would get an apply to each loop. All right, so then some conditions to that. So here I have that return fax number. And as you, you might have seen, you know, on the on the record, I, I was quick and I closed dynamics. I don't have anything entered in the fax field, right? So as I don't have anything in that in that field, if I just use that dot and then the, the field name and the field's empty, the flow will fail. Now if I use this small question mark, then boom, you know, the flow won't fail, it'll keep on going. So jumping onto this side, as you can see, there's no, whoa, that's a big error. There is no facts, so the flow fails, the action fails. No worries, you know, I had that, you know, it's, it's optional, that value with that question mark, the action will, you know, the action will uh, succeed and the flow will continue on. Let's see, we have some additional list record scopes for integer. Here we have that secure input and output that I wanna show you guys real quick. So here I have chosen to secure the, the output. And if I look at my flow, I can see that nothing is displayed. So maybe, you know, if you do have to expose your, if your secrets in your flow, then definitely use the, the secure output action so that, that so that people can access those uh, secrets that you've exposed. Here's an example of concurrency control and fetch XML, uh, fetch XML. So I'm listing projects, and I want to list all projects that are related to do, 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 do link entity here is uh, account. I want to fetch some data here from account and the account has to be beer company. So I'm using fetch XML for that. And then I'm getting a nice apply to each loop, which I really can't avoid in, in, in uh, this case, but that doesn't really matter. All right, moving on towards the bottom. I have a list list accounts bogus name action here. I wonder what this is. Now I'm openly thinking, what the heck was this action? Hmm. This might have been a result of some of my tests. So let's actually, <laughs> let's disregard that, that baby there and jump over to child flows. So for child flows, uh, what I'm gonna do with child flows, I'm gonna compose hello and then world. Well, wow, very, uh, very original. And then I'm going to run a child flow called child flow Peter method by John Liu. And then what what is returned from that child flow is composed right here. And the how that child flow works is I'm going to use a power apps uh, power apps trigger. And with that, I can pull in data from that previous flow. 
and then I'm doing a Peter method by John Flo, uh, a Peter method by John Liu, which which John talked about in Flow Conference 2019, and this is actually super cool. So, uh, what that essentially is is when I have an apply to each loop, and I'm composing a value, a single value in that apply to each loop. I can actually get this value from inside the loop outside of that loop as well by referencing this uh, this action. So it says output compose current item in loop. And when I punch in that expression, the value that's that's going to be stored here is going to be visible outside the loop. Well, that's brilliant. Imagine if you have a situation where you're using parse JSON and you pick some of those dynamic content with parse JSON, you're going to get that annoying loop sometimes, right? So you can use this, the Peter method, to escape that loop and to compose the value of that loop outside, outside your flow. And this is how it looks like. So I have that compose right here. The value is uh, seems to be zero. And here, geez, what am I doing here? Oh, yes, I have an array here. Yeah, so I have an array here, or I'm building an array. As you can see, it goes from 0, 1, and so on. And I'm actually building from inside this loop. I'm exposing it outside the loop and then returning that, that value to my master flow. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. So. I think I have like a few more minutes to go. I'm going to try and stop this pretty uh, pretty sharply for Thomas to to pick up. What I'm going to show you here is a a uh, a concurrency control flow for uh, a real life example for that concurrency uh, control trigger. So you can consider if you know if you would implement this flow the way I've done it, or if you would use concurrency control. So what I have open is a Forms Pro survey. Now, if I if my answer is three or less, what's going to happen is uh, the flow is going to create a single parent case, and then it's going to create a child case for all answers with that are equal less than or equal to three. So let's fire this off. And as you can probably imagine, I'm creating lots of cases. I need to reference the parent case. So what I need to do here is make sure that uh, that the cases that are created are are unique. So the only way to really accomplish that, and let's see if this fires off just fine. The only way to really accomplish that is to use child flows for error handling. All right, here we go. So I have 20 questions, and as you can see, 20 questions, I had 20 flows because it's based on responses. And they will soon succeed. And let's see if I have any child flows fired off here. Yes, I do. Yeah. So if we open up this, uh, this succeeded flow, what this has done is this has now created a, a single master case. And then it has created parent cases. Now, what I need to do here is I need to check if parent case creation has succeeded. And if it has succeeded, then I'm going to create child cases. But if parent case creation has failed, then I need to fire off a child flow. And as you can see, some child flows have been have been fired off. And that child flow is then the one that creates those uh, child cases. Uh, so this is 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 fairly is a fairly complex flow, I'd guess. Uh, Says it's not something that I can dissect in a few minutes, but in any case, the the point here is, you know, you, would you implement this? Would you really, you know, would you check if that parent case creation has succeeded, and then you would run your child flows, or would you would you rather let's let's click on edit? Would you rather just turn on concurrency control and ensure that the degree of parallelism would be one, for example. So in this case, I would have 
I had those 20 questions. So the flow will fire off 20 times, but instead of those flows running simultaneously, they would be they would be queued. So I'd only have a single act, act of flow running at, 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 at a given instance in time. And that way I could actually make my flow less complicated, not have to use child flows and make it more straightforward. The problem with this is if I want to come back to the logic and, and you know do something else, then you know this flow is stuck to this concurrency control. So if I want to change it later on, then I need to this big flow I need to rebuild it. So here's you know for, for you to consider a, a kind of like an actual use case. Would you use concurrency control or not? And now I've got to be really careful to hit cancel because I definitely don't want to turn that on. Uh, so with this, you know, this was a fairly, I guess, fast presentation. Uh, with this, some tips and tricks around flows. And uh, yeah, any uh, questions? I'll give you guys two minutes and then we'll hand it off to Thomas. OK, I see a question from Mohammed. Uh, can we pass a lookup field as a parameter to child flow so he wants to create um child flow to create a task and wants to use that child flow in a few flows yeah 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 you can so mm -hmm. um what you're going to do is is you have that uh lookup field so you're going to do a get records and you you know you're going to do get records and you're going to punch in that that dynamic content for that that lookup and then you just you compose it, you push it into that child flow, and you can reference it there. And this is actually something you, it might still be one of those limitations where we have, where we fire off flows from Canvas apps. Uh, in some of those cases, and the, those that, that you know have built Canvas apps probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, in some of those cases, you do need to use uh, ch child flows to get things working. Uh, so yeah, you can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Let me see. Gary has a question at the bottom. Ah, yeah. So assigning assigning records to a specific user and team. So that's a very good question. Yes, you can assign records to a specific user or a team. It, interestingly, there was just a question about this on another uh, another channel yesterday. Uh, you know, I've actually never done it. I've I've never had that for now. That requirement you can do it, but there is a trick to it. If Ryan, Daniel, uh, Thomas, someone online, if you remember what that trick was, you know, please you know, make yourselves uh, known. Uh, off the top of my head, I forget it, but you can definitely do that. <laughs> 